the Final Fantasy series has been one of the staples of the Japanese role-playing genre since 1987. And since Part 4, or Part 2 in the West, at the latest, it counted as one of the most important narrative-driven video game series in the mainstream. Since Part 8, however, it seems every single entry was met with polarizing opinions, either criticizing the gameplay decisions, the story, or the setting. And in 2006, when the 12th main entry of the series was released on the PlayStation 2, people were just as divided. Ignoring Final Fantasy XI, the only series MMO released up to that point, Final Fantasy XII decided to ditch a lot of aspects that the series was known for, like random encounters and turn-based combat. And that after X already got rid of the world map. In fact, you could basically play it in a way that combat would play out by itself without doing a single button input. But let's not jump the gun just yet, and let's talk about the game in a more structured manner. So, let's start with a short overview. Final Fantasy XII is a role-playing game where you control six characters, Van, Penelo, Balthia, Fran, Bash and Ash, through the land of Ivalice, trying to find a way to fight the Arcadian Empire, who have overrun our hero's homeland, Dalmasca. You get to explore many different areas, towns and dungeons, fight monsters and bosses, and do side quests. Defeating monsters rewards you with experience and license points, and loot, which you can sell for money, which in turn you can spend on equipment. Enough experience points will level up your characters, which raises their basic stats. License points can be used on the license board to unlock new perks and licenses to use new weapons and armor. Combat is happening in real time, and you can either choose to assign your commands manually or via the Gambit system, which is basically an AI, where you can tell your characters to act in a specific way under specific circumstances. If you played other Final Fantasy games before, you're going to find a lot of things that you are expecting from a game in the series. Chocobos? Check. Moogles? Check. Gil? Check. A character named Sid? Check. A teenage pretty boy with a face you want to punch? Check. Airships? Check. A pretty boy villain with long hair? Check. Towns where you can spend your gil on equipment and magic? Check. Another character named Sid? Check. Espers? Check. Magic spells that have stronger variants with names ending in Ra and Ga? Check. Puddings, Marlboros, Curls, Bombs, check. Victory Fanfare, check. So, it is a Final Fantasy game through and through. Even if it has aspects to it that some veterans may disapprove of. In 2017, the game's Zodiac Edition was released on PS4. A remaster of Final Fantasy XII International Zodiac Jobs System, which was previously only available in Japan. In 2018 it was released on PC, and in 2019 on Nintendo Switch and on Xbox One. The Zodiac Age Edition brought a couple of changes with it that would make the game more accessible for new players. But before we go into details, let's talk about the story and the characters first. Like pretty much every other Final Fantasy game, the story of XII doesn't have any connections to its predecessors. However, it's set in Ivalice, presumably the same world as Final Fantasy Tactics and Vagrant Story which, like 12, were also written and directed by Yasumi Matsuno. I haven't played either of the two, so I can't get into detail on how much they are actually overlapping. Since over the past decade, I've heard a lot of people comparing the story and aesthetics to a certain sci-fi franchise, I'm gonna give you a little summary and present it like this. It is a period of war. After the small nation of Dalmasca was conquered by the Arcadian Empire, it is now caught between the warring fronts of Rosaria and Arcadia. Vain Solidor, the son of the Arcadian Emperor, has been appointed consul of Rabanaster, Dalmasca's capital. With the aid of the maniacal Dr. Sid, he plans to develop artificial nethocyte to turn the tides of war in their favor, thus threatening Dalmasca to be obliterated in the process. However, a group of resistance fighters, led by Princess Ash of Dalmasca, plan to liberate the small kingdom from Arcadia's grip. The Dusk Shard, an old heirloom said to have once belonged to the Dynast King, has been secretly kept in Rabanaster's royal palace for centuries. It might be the key to their salvation. Yeah, this joke has probably been done before, but who cares. Anyway, I personally don't feel reminded of Star Wars that much. Of course, some archetypes are overlapping here and there, while Thea is kinda like Han Solo, both scoundrels with a heart of gold, each having bounties on their heads, 
Fran is kind of like Chewbacca, the scoundrel's co-pilot coming from a race that lives in trees. Princess Ash is kind of like Leia, both fearless princesses leading a resistance. And then there are the judges who have a bit of a Darth Vader vibe going on. And cutscenes like these also feel a little bit Star Warsy, but then again, anything with battles involving a massive amount of flying vehicles is gonna remind you of Star Wars, and I feel that's where the similarities end. The world and story of Final Fantasy XII feel like they're doing their own thing. Maybe they took some inspiration here and there, but when I look at this game, I just don't see Star Wars. I see Final Fantasy more than anything else. It features a lot of political intrigue, betrayal, revenge, forgiveness, those kinds of things, and that is where the focus lies. Unfortunately though, when it comes to the way the story is told, they made some unfortunate decisions. But more on that later. Let's get into the characters first, starting with our six heroes. You play as Van, a street urchin and thief from Arbanaster, whose brother died fighting the Arcadian Empire and who wishes to become a sky pirate. I'll be a sky pirate. Free to go where I will. At his side is Penelo, his childhood friend. What do you think you're doing? I thought that this money was the people of Dalmasca's property. The Imperials stole it from us, so it's only fair that we take it back. It's our duty as Dalmascans. Well, wasn't that what you said? Yeah, but I never said anything about taking it back from me. Early on you are joined by Balthir, a sky pirate with ties to Arcadia and who is pretty much the coolest character in the game. I play the leading man. Who else? And there's also his partner in crime, Fran, a Viera, a giant bunny lady who knows quite a lot about Ivalis and the creatures that inhabit the land. The Gareth people live by the old ways. Matricide lore is a part of their culture. Then we have Bash von Ronsenberg, a former captain of the Dalmascan army, who spent the past two years in captivity after having been accused of murdering his king. Let them watch. I know something of cages. The king also happened to be the father of our last member of the group, Princess Ash, the young determined leader of the resistance against the Empire, whose husband also died in the war. This is something that I have to do. Not only for myself, but for all those who have fallen. I will not be made to hide. I'll fight alone if I must. On the opposing side, we have the Arcadian judges, who are the protectors of the law and to command the Arcadian army led by Judge Magister Gabranth. The Emperor is willing to overlook race for his more talented servants. However, those that do not show respect will receive none in kind. Dr. Sid, a brilliant scientist who may or may not be talking to an invisible friend most of the time. Nabadis taught us much. Yes, it's well hidden. They'll be off chasing after shadows, the fools. Ah, yes. The reins of history back in the hands of man. And Vane, son of the Akkadian Emperor and Consul of Rabanaster. He serves as our main antagonist. My hands are stained with blood. I see little reason to stay them now. We also have a couple of allies, some of which occasionally join our party for a little bit, like Larsa, who's the younger brother of Vane. And so I sue for peace, to stop short war and ease their suffering. My father will choose peace. A big ally to the Resistance is Marquis Ondor IV, who also serves as the game's narrator. The fall of the fortress at Nalbana told the destruction of the greater part of Dalmascus forces. And this is where I have to mention one of the biggest contributors to what is problematic about the narrative. I'm not saying that this couldn't work in general, but this story would have benefited from being told through the eyes of our protagonist. This way, we just get interrupted now and then to hear Ondor saying convoluted stuff about who goes where, who does what, and who is fighting whom, using a lot of weird terminology that will confuse us even more. We don't get any real development of the relationships between the characters. There are very few little memorable moments like we see in other Final Fantasy games. <laughs> and there's a bit of a problem with our protagonist as well. In theory, this should be the story about a bystander who, due to random circumstances, ends up joining a revolution against an overpowered foe. But from what we get to see in the game, it only feels like Van is just... there. Without really having any reason of being there. He technically has a motivation, with his brother being killed and all that, but most of the time it feels like he's just tagging along, while the important characters do all the relevant stuff. 
Don't interrupt me, Vaughn. After his introduction to Robin Nestor, he gets pushed more and more into the background, only with occasionally getting something to do. But that also feels more like the writers going, Oh crap, we forgot about Vaughn again. Quick, let's find some way for him to be useful. So in the end, he almost has about as much purpose to be in the story as the dwarf in the first Dungeons and Dragons movie. <laughs> It doesn't help that he's milk toast, an amalgamation of all the most boring tropes from previous Final Fantasy heroes. To be fair though, he is one character trait that makes him distinct from the others. He's a bit of an idiot. You're a dead man, don't forget it. And no names, of course. I don't know what's in that mind Lamont, but you're in good hands. Right, Bosh? His friend Pinello is just there because he is. And she is also kinda bland. So already we have two characters who are just tagging along for the ride. Balthier and Fran are probably the most interesting characters in the game. It's just fun to listen to Balthier talk, bicker and interact with others, due to his wisecracking and arrogance. But overall good intended nature. Well, at least your sword is to the point. The giant bunny lady plays well off on him. Well, Fran is special in that she deigned to partner with a Hume. Oh? Like a sky pirate that chooses to steal through the sewers. And I must admit that I really like the voice actress's performance. There's just something about the way she talks. A pleasant lie, that. I am unwelcome, an unsought guest in their wood. But of course, I have to mention that this kind of rather revealing design is a little problematic. I feel that her behind being on constant display undermines her character a little bit. Bash von Ronsenberg? I gotta admit, I love this guy. And I can't exactly pinpoint why. He's stoic and honorable, basically the archetype of a knight and royal bodyguard. But there's definitely a certain coolness to him, similar to Orin from Final Fantasy X. At age 36, he also shows that characters over the age of 20 and even 30 can still be awesome and are not actually old. Spoken like a guy in his early 30s. His design is great, and in my opinion, he really should have been the protagonist instead of Vaughn. I'm Captain Bosch von Ronsenberg of Dalmaska. Don't interrupt me, Vaughn. He has an arc, he has plenty of motivation, and he's basically what a hero should be. Interestingly enough, the original idea for the protagonist was to have a non-teen hero this time around, but due to worries by the XX that someone in their 30s may be unappealing as a main character, they went for the rather generic Vaughn instead. Ah, uh, nice fun. Princess Ash? There's actually not much I can say about her either, because she also feels a little one note. But the story of a young princess trying to free her kingdom from the grip of an opposing empire and dealing with the inner struggle of whether exacting revenge for the killing of her husband and murder of her father or wanting peace could have worked quite well for the main protagonist as well. Unfortunately, as it is, it's just not told very well. Either way, any of these characters would have been a better protagonist than Vaughn. It is a shame, because the story itself is good, and it does hold a lot of potential. The political intrigue is fun and interesting. A lot of the characters are intriguing, and I do have the feeling that there is lore behind everything even when it comes to smaller cultures that you only briefly encounter along the way, like the Gareth. Even Vane's and Sid's goals as antagonists make sense, and they're kind of subversive. On the other hand, the narrative is very straightforward. There are no real twists or major mind-blowing moments, no reveals like your hero being some sort of deity's dream or strange time travel plots where everything is a big causality loop. It is a quote-unquote down-to-earth story about a small nation being caught between two fronts of a major war, and this can be seen as a positive or a negative, depending on what you want from a Final Fantasy game story. I personally found it kind of refreshing. And what I do like quite a bit as well is that you have several minor antagonists. One thing I love in video games is bad guys being teased at, that you eventually get to fight later on, and recurring villains, and this game has a couple. The judges are fun, and Sid is also quite a good villain. And I think if our heroes had a more personal connection to Vayne and encountered him more times during the course of the story, he would have worked a lot better as the main antagonist. But he's good enough as he is. 
in the beginning, he's not introduced as a bad guy. I mean, you most likely can tell that he's the villain, just because Final Fantasy in general is not very subtle when it comes to these things, but he's charismatic and friendly. And the way he interacts with Van's parental figure and employer, Miguelo, establishes him as a man of the people, at first at least. Henceforth, I am a citizen of Rabanaster. Why don't you call me Vane? I could not. That would not be right. You are overly fond of formalities. I have just the remedy for that. Tonight you will join me, and we shall drink until you call me by name. Another problem with the story? A big part of it is the conflict between Arcadia and Rosaria. You meet Rosaria's leader, Al Cid, and they kinda tease you with the possibility that you will eventually get to visit his country as well, offering you a whole new kingdom to explore. But instead, the game is just randomly hit by the climax, and then it just ends. Despite the game being extremely long, I remember originally being caught off guard by this. When I first played it in 2006, it felt like a promise of something greater, which just wasn't delivered. But since we just talked about how the story is presented, let's talk about the presentation in general. Considering that by the time of writing this video, the game is already 16 years old, I find that the visuals hold up quite nicely, of course. Its age does show in some regards, especially when you see some blocky architecture, but the design of the characters and environments still make everything appealing to look at. What really does look quite well, even nowadays, are the pre-rendered cutscenes. I mean, sure, characters nowadays look more photorealistic, but everything looks coherent and just pleasant. When it comes to soundtracks, Final Fantasy has always been one of the best thanks to longtime composer Nobuo Umatsu. Unfortunately, his involvement in 12 was extremely limited, and it might be because of this that the music doesn't quite compare to the previous entries. That being said, and despite my original disappointment back then, the soundtrack itself is quite good, and several tunes are going to stick in your brain long after you turn the console off. It just lacks tracks that are as memorable as Terra's theme from Final Fantasy VI, One Winged Angel from Seven. Liberi Fatali from 8 and so on. So yeah, in terms of both visual and sound design, everything is top-notch. The designs of the people, the creatures and monsters, the weapons and clothing, the armor and the vehicles, everything looks great and memorable. The music is beautiful and the sound effects are great. Overall, thanks to its great presentation, the world created for Final Fantasy XII is still very inviting. This leads us to the world of the game itself. The land of Ivalice is a big place and features a lot of biomes, towns, caves and dungeons to explore, monsters to fight, and people of different races and cultures to interact with. There is a lot of variety in the different parts of the land, ranging from deserts to jungles and beaches to icy mountaintops. Of course, there are also more fantastical places, floating islands, an abandoned haunted palace in a zombie infested swamp, which is all that remains of a former kingdom destroyed in a cataclysmic event. Or, one of my favorites, a literal sansi. Of the different races you encounter, humes are the most common ones. They're practically humans, and have a lot of different cultures themselves, and their own dialects, or even language. For example, the people of Bujerba talk with a bit of a British Indian accent. Lord Lassa's cortege has already rejoined the Imperial Detachment. I am told they will depart for Rabanastar upon the arrival of the fleet this eventide. And they often use non-English words when you interact with them. Arcadia is a very technologically advanced empire, while Damascus feels a bit like a 1001 night setting. Of course, this fantasy setting is also filled with other humanoid races that can be found all over Ivalice, including the fluffy little Moogles, which make a return again, like in almost every Final Fantasy. Part of me wishes that you'd get a party member of each race, but the only non-human on your team is Fran. Eviera, which are tall bunny people that are very close to nature. Seems a bit like wasted potential, but eh. Like in the classic Final Fantasy games, towns have different shops where you can buy weapons, armor and supplies, like potions and remedies, and phoenix downs. And they also have pubs where you can accept bounties, but more on that later. Many of the areas that you get to visit during the main questline have optional sections that are barred off initially, but become visitable later on when certain conditions have been fulfilled. These usually are filled with tougher monsters and optional bosses and more valuable loot and treasure. So the game actually invites you to revisit old areas. The place you'll most likely revisit the most is Rabanaster, the capital of Dalmasca. From areas that are accessible to the player, 
this is probably the biggest town that you can explore. Unfortunately, oftentimes you only get to see small parts of a larger area. For example, eventually you reach Arcades, the capital of the Arcadian Empire, which looks super impressive from afar. A ginormous high-tech city with flying vehicles and a whole other aesthetic from Dalmasca. But when you finally get to enter the city, all you get to explore are a couple of streets, which is a bit of a letdown. And I had a similar feeling when I got to explore the necro hole of Nabudis. Nabudis is a city that was completely annihilated in a giant explosion during the war, and it's now inhabited by monsters and the spirits of those who lost their lives that fateful day. I wish we got to explore the ruins of the city itself, but instead all you get to see are the ruins of the palace and the swampy area around it. Overall, however, there's a lot of variation between the places that you get to visit, and they all have a different theme going on, and you get to see individual assets here and there that are unique to a specific place. Furthermore, many areas have shifting weather conditions, which occasionally even have an effect on the gameplay, like certain bounties may only show up when it's cloudy, or when there is a blizzard. And the Giza plains to the south of Rabanaster completely change during the rainy season, which is every couple of hours, as there are suddenly rivers blocking your path and new and stronger enemies appear. There may not be a day or night cycle, but I find the weather conditions to be a nice little feature. The level design tends to feel a bit archaic, a lot of the environments are rather blocky and rectangular, and just consist of long narrow hallways that branch and reconnect, and the dungeons themselves oftentimes also feel quite stale. But you also have a lot of wide open areas that you can approach differently, sometimes leading to higher level areas with tough monsters that will kick your butt if you don't turn back. And this is something I really like as well. Being able to take glimpses at places that you may come back to later on, once you're strong enough. This kind of philosophy is not found often in games nowadays, as many developers want you to be able to go anywhere from the very beginning, making the enemies scale with you instead. It is a matter of preference, but I enjoy this kind of old school design more, because it gives you motivation to become stronger and advance. It invokes that feeling of mystery and desire to explore, and I really love that. Especially when you realize, oh, that one area I found hours ago? Maybe I'm finally strong enough to get back and see what it has to offer. The dungeons tend to come with some sort of puzzle or gimmick, like switch puzzles, where you need to press a switch or pull a lever somewhere which closes some doors and opens others. They are a neat way to bring some variety into the gameplay, but ultimately they can feel a bit tedious. One of the worst dungeons in the game is the optional area within the giant crystal in Girovagan. It's an incredibly huge maze where everything looks the same, and you have some timed puzzles where a certain switch removes a specific barrier and then you have a short time frame where you need to find your way to the newly opened path. All while getting past extremely strong and infinitely spawning enemies. This entire section felt like hell to me, and boy oh boy am I glad that they implemented a new autosaving feature for this remaster, where your progress gets saved whenever you change the area. This feature makes dying a lot less frustrating, because in the original version, it could take ages to get back to the spot where you were hit by a game over screen. Oh, and this dungeon doesn't have a map either. Leaving these dungeons can be extremely frustrating as well, like with this one in particular, as the only thing you get is a shortcut to another point of the dungeon. But you still have to find your way through this gigantic maze, which is super annoying. Kinda makes me wish they had implemented an item like the escape rope found in Pokemon games, just to save some time. As there is also quite a bit of walking involved, I'm also happy about the new feature that allows you to play with double and four times the normal speed. The increased speed also has a positive effect on what I'm about to talk next. Namely, the combat and the character progression. The combat, of course, is a big part of every Final Fantasy game. And I must say, I really love the combat in 12. But it's not for everybody. As I mentioned before, this was the first mainline single-player Final Fantasy game that featured real-time combat. Looking back at the older titles, the random encounters take away a lot of the replayability for me. So I consider it to be amazing that there are none here. Instead, enemies roam the areas you explore and can be fought or outmaneuvered. You can have a maximum of three members on your team at the same time, plus an additional slot for guest party members during certain story sections. Now when you fight, by opening the combat menu you can either choose to select your attacks, spells and item usage manually. Every action takes a bit of time, like when you select attack, a little gauge fills up and your character attacks once that gauge is full. Instead of selecting every action manually, you can also rely on the AI that you can set yourself. When it comes to your attacks, your characters can equip a variety of different weapons, each with its own advantages and disadvantages. Swords, katanas, daggers, spears, bows, guns and more. They may come with elemental damage or other perks, 
But that also means that if someone is equipped with a weapon that, for example, does ice damage, it may not have an effect or even heal an enemy that is immune to ice. But you can change your combat gear mid-combat without any penalty, so there's not too much to worry about in that regard. In terms of spells, there are attack spells that deal damage to foes or healing spells that restore your team's health. And there are also spells that buff your characters, like doubling their HP or making them faster or increase damage for a limited amount of time. Of course, there are also debuffs for enemies, like making them slower or poisoning them. You also have special attacks called Mists, which can be learned on the license board and used once their respective gauges are filled up. This happens whenever your characters deal or take damage. When you use them, you have a short time limit that allows you to combine them with other mist attacks. This is very RNG based, as you need to shuffle your options over and over until you finally get an option to refill your gauge or to do a follow-up attack. It is kinda neat if you manage to get a combo of like 10 plus hits, but honestly, I have no clue what the story behind these attacks is, and why our characters are able to do what they're doing. It's not like the limit breaks in the other Final Fantasy games, where they do special attacks that feel in character, like Titus doing a fancy somersault sword move or something like that. Here I have no clue why there are suddenly three belt fears that summon a meteor... Uh, ah, well, at least they're pretty to look at. You can also use the mist gauge to summon espers that you have acquired. Most of them are found in optional areas or after side quests, and you need to defeat them first in order to be able to summon them. But honestly, I rarely had a reason to use them as they're not particularly strong. Granted, I never tried the higher tier ones, but overall finding the espers, fighting and acquiring them is a lot more fun than they're actually useful. And unlocking them on the license board usually rewards the relevant character with one or two perks that can be unlocked. Defeating enemies rewards your characters with experience and license points. Reaching a certain amount of experience points will level up your character, which improves their basic stats like health, magic points and attack power. While license points can be spent on the license board to unlock new abilities, perks and permissions to use for spells, weapons and armor. In the original version of Final Fantasy XII, the license board was a giant board shared between every character and they all started on a different spot on this board. In the Zodiac Age edition, however, you get to choose two classes for every character, and every class has its own license board. Unfortunately, I felt that the license boards for each class were a little too small, as I completed every one of them while I was still far away from finishing the game, which felt a little demotivating. It also seems that many of the perks appear to be pointless to their respective class, like the melee-focused Bushi having a ton of magic strengthening feels, even though magic is not a part of this class. And if you unlock those, and then select a magic-based secondary class, those fields are shared and already unlocked. Uh, I don't quite get it. However, the level cap is at 99, and reaching that will take a lot of time. The different character classes allow you to go for the classic RPG setup of having a tank, a healer, and a damage dealer, i.e. you can use your character with the most HP as a tank, by casting a lure spell on them so enemies will only target that particular character, while another character will heal, and another will either cast debuffs on the enemy or attack constantly. I find that all of this works rather well, since the gambit system is quite reliable, and given the game's structure and how competent everything works, like when buffing your team before getting into a tough battle, I even got MMO vibes. For combat itself, there are two different settings. You can either choose that the game pauses when you open the combat menu, or that the game keeps going. I personally recommend that the game pauses, because things might get hectic, and if you direly need to use an item and gotta find it in a long list of items in your possession first, that may prove problematic when you are under attack. Some people may find it off-putting that the combat is very melee-focused and that offensive magic has less use than in other Final Fantasy titles, especially since melee attacks are the most effective way to deal with foes, since you can keep attacking automatically and magic is just too much of a hassle to control. It's difficult to find an optimal way to let the AI use offensive magic efficiently. While we're at it, the AI that you can set up is called the Gambit system. How it works is that you can set conditions for each of your characters, including the one you're controlling at the time. These conditions basically look like if A, then B. For example, if monster is close by, attack, or if party member's health is below 50%, use healing spell. Or, enemy has low health, attack with fire spell. Alternatively, you can do stupid crap like, if enemy health is below 80%, give potion to enemy. Or, if enemy is immune to ice, use remedy. Or, if party member is almost dead, attack that party member. These may be useless, but you got options. 
There are some limitations, but the amount of things you can do with this is quite big. Initially, your characters have only two gambit slots available, but you unlock more over time. Back in 2006, when this game was first released, the gambit system was revolutionary, and variations of it are present in games by other developers as well, like Dragon Age Origins or Pillars of Eternity 2. However, it received a lot of criticism at the time, because a lot of players felt that this would result in the game playing itself, and there is some truth to that. I remember hearing some journalists say that if you are using gambits that do not work for a boss fight, you would basically have to reload, change your gambits and try the battle again. This however is complete nonsense. For one, you can change gambits mid-combat. It's easy to just pause the game and turn some of them off, replace them, or just go for a different set altogether, as you can have up to three presets at the same time. And also, I do not recommend solely relying on gambits, because that is just counterproductive in my opinion. I, for my part, always had a couple of gambits active that resulted in my characters healing each other, treating status effects, and doing basic attacks on nearby enemies. And as the game's difficulty is not super high on the main path, I basically ended up curb stomping every monster in my path while barely doing anything myself. At this point I'm going to bring up a neat change for the remaster that I've mentioned before already. You can play the game at double or even four times the speed. And this in combination with the gambit system makes things like farming for experience to level up your character, or loot to afford the best gear, a pretty chill and almost meditative experience, as you just cut through enemy ranks like butter. So yes, in these cases you may end up not doing much yourself, except for maybe keeping an eye on your HP, MP and supplies, to make sure that you don't die before you heal at the next save crystal. But there are occasional standard mobs where this could backfire as well, so don't take it too easy. And the bosses usually require more strategy. For those I tend to keep my standard gambits active while manually casting buffs and spells and attacking when the timing is right. I find this formula insanely satisfying. Let's say you're just grinding for XP or money. There's something to it, just running through enemy hordes, seeing your team slashing away, with the occasional level up popping up, especially at a higher speed. There's also a feature where killing the same kind of enemy sets up a combo counter, and after that one gets to a specific point, you may get better loot from them, which makes it even more satisfying. There's a nice balance between the chill running down enemies and then the occasional skill check with stronger ones. What is also worth mentioning is, there is a very arcane form of crafting in the game. Depending on what kind of loot you sell, you unlock different things at the bazaar. This means you can farm specific loot from specific enemies, sell them, and that will reward you with specific items that you can use. However, it is very convoluted unless you are using a guide, since you most likely tend to sell all your loot you acquired in one go, so you won't know what combinations let you buy what items. Some of the best weapons can mainly be acquired through the system, which is a little frustrating, but it's optional. And speaking of optional... As I just mentioned, the main storyline is not very difficult, unless you ignore all the optional content and rush through things without leveling up every now and then. The more challenging parts have to be looked for specifically. For one, there are the Hunter's Marks. Early on in the game, you join a hunter's guild by the name of Clan Centurio. The regular marks can be accepted at hunter's boards and pubs, and sometimes other locations. The more difficult marks, called the elite marks, can be accepted when talking to the clan leader, a Mughal named Mont Blanc. After accepting a mark, you usually have to find and talk to whoever posted the request. Then find the location of the mark, defeat it, and then return to the quest giver. There tend to be certain preconditions to be met before you can fight the monsters in question though. Sometimes they only appear under certain weather conditions, or when all monsters in the area have been defeated. And sometimes they can only be found in areas that are barred off and need to be unlocked first by doing other side quests. The monsters you get to hunt for the clan are the most straightforward kind of side quests in the game, as you have a device referred to as the clan primer, which keeps track of which enemy you are hunting and where you need to go. Other side quests, however, are more cryptic. They aren't tracked anywhere, and you actually need to listen to the people who give them to you if you want to know what to do and where to go. This is a bit problematic if you're like me and think, I've played this game already 15 years ago, no need to read through all of this, and then wonder, wait, how do I open the gate to the Barnheim Passage again? Only to look it up and realize, oh, this person in this settlement wanted me to go to that settlement in the north and I need to run back and forth a couple of times so the ferry starts going again, and then I need to pick up that flower to get the cactoids in that other village north of the river to leave, then go to that person and find a couple of things here and there, return to that person, leave the area, re-enter the area, and then talk to that new NPC behind that house to get a key. Yeesh. And again, these side quests are neither tracked nor highlighted anywhere. No pop-up text telling you that you've accepted a quest, no exclamation marks floating above people's heads, no nothing. 
it's all the dialogue with run-of-the-mill NPCs. On the one hand, it is a little frustrating, especially when you consider the clan primer that spells things out to you. But on the other hand, I really enjoy this crypticness. It adds a level of mystery to the game that requires you to think a little for yourself and to explore. Kinda like Dark Souls. I've played through this game three times by now and I keep discovering new things, like side quests that I wasn't aware of. And holy moly, it was only now while I was editing this video that I learned there was a fishing minigame in this game, which completely blew my mind. Anyway, some of these marks are really challenging and time consuming. They got so much HP and changed their tactics during combat and defeating them is a very slow process. Reviving team members, reapplying buffs, refilling your MP, attacking when the time is right, using special attacks, these are all things where you can't necessarily rely on your gambits and you need to pay attention. Some of them may take around half an hour to beat. It's grueling, but ultimately quite satisfying in the end. The final mark for which you need to complete another cryptic side quest, and all other marks first, I haven't gotten around to beating it yet. But if the wiki is to be trusted, on average, it takes about two hours to beat him. Which is insane! I attempted him twice and both times I died after around 45 minutes. And then I just got sad and quit the game. In the original version of the game, you could only save at save crystals. This could make matters quite frustrating, or rather, downright infuriating. Like when you were finally able to defeat a tough foe after a long and grueling battle, but then died to some randos on your way back. You sometimes would lose hours of progress because you just spent ages combing through a dungeon and then get a game over screen because you stepped on an invisible trap while trying to escape some tough enemies. Side note, don't mess with elementals. One thing that is unfortunately missing from this game is a non-combat focused extra activity, something equivalent to Triple Triad or Tetra Master or Blitzball from Final Fantasy VIII, IX and X. You can find a couple of minigames here and there, but they feel lackluster by comparison. And that's a bit of a shame when you consider how big of an optional part those were in the other games. But all in all, this game will keep you quite busy, especially if you want to 100% complete it. And this leads me to my verdict. I remembered Final Fantasy XII to kind of feel like an MMORPG, just offline. And while replaying it, I definitely got a lot of MMO vibes again, just minus other players criticizing me for being bad at the game. And what I've actually noticed is that in many ways it does feel like a proto Final Fantasy XIV. A lot of areas look and feel similar, and there are parallels between the Arcadian and Garlean empires, both in terms of design and goals. The Gambit system used in 12 also served as the basis for the AI system for companions in Final Fantasy XIV Shadowbringers, called the Trust System. The MMO feeling was actually what drew me in back then, and it kinda is what drew me back in again now. I have tried out several MMOs, including Final Fantasy XIV and World of Warcraft, as in, I played them by myself. And while I do appreciate them and think they are fun, my problem is that playing by myself can only get me so far, and eventually I would need help from other people to progress. I know that's kind of the point of MMOs. I personally find interacting with other players difficult and stressful, and I don't like multiplayer or competitive games. The feeling of having other players rely on my abilities to have fun playing a game, it's just too much pressure for me. Not to mention, toxic and very demanding community members can be a huge cause of anxiety, especially to highly sensitive people like me. This is why, for my verdict, despite my many complaints and points of criticism, I still gotta say that I absolutely adored this game. If you tried out Final Fantasy XIV or any MMO and then realized that you kinda like the gameplay loop and the way they are structured but you don't like playing with other people, then I'd say give Final Fantasy XII a try. As a fan who's played most of the Final Fantasy series, I see myself coming back to this one sooner than to any of the others. It's hard for me to say which Final Fantasy game is my favorite, but 12 is definitely in my top 3. As much as I love 6, the random encounters can make it a little annoying to play nowadays. And even though I really enjoyed the 7 remake, it was lacking a ton of things that I want in an RPG, like rewarding character progression, exploration, and a bit of mystery. That's why I think that 12 combines the best of both worlds. Ivalice has a lot to offer if you stray away from the main path. You don't get constantly interrupted by random encounters while just trying to get from point A to B. And you still get all the Final Fantasy fluff, from the music, to the creatures, to the overall style. Granted, the story is far less gripping and emotional than the series is otherwise known for, but you have clear goals you want to accomplish and clear enemies that you want to defeat. The combat system is a love it or hate it kind of thing. 
but for me personally, I enjoyed it immensely, and the addition of being able to play it four times the speed really adds to the fun. I'd say if you watch this video and think this combat system might be up your alley, then it probably is. It actually is also a neat little time waster, especially when you play it on Nintendo Switch. There's just something about running through dungeons at high speed grinding for XP while you watch something on YouTube. It feels like this game is barely spoken about these days, and in my humble opinion, it deserves a lot more love. Final Fantasy XII, I think you're amazing, and I wish Square would finally release another game that is more like you. Thank you for watching. Oh, there's actually a sequel on the Nintendo DS called Revenant Wings. It looks weird. I never played it. Again, thank you so much for watching. A lot of time and work went into making this video. It took me about three months. So yeah, creating these videos is a lot of effort. So I'd definitely appreciate it if you were to leave a like and maybe even subscribe to my channel. You can also leave a nice little comment if you want. Thanks, and I hope you have a lovely day. Don't interrupt me, Vaughn.